Welcome to the Waste Not What Not podcast. I'm Philippa Ross, human ecologist, enthusiologist, author and energy healer, bringing you inspirational interviews, news and tips to rebuild the relationship between people and the planet the way nature intended by revitalizing our natural resources, minimizing waste and maximizing human potential. I trust you discover seeds of hope for a vibrant future so you can cultivate and transform them to suit your own lifestyle in order for us to collectively create a world where reverence for the diversity of all life is honoured. You'll find all the show notes in the description and lots more about me and my work at philipparos.com. And don't forget, if you like what you hear, be sure to share far and wide. Hello, Waste Busters. Welcome to episode 25. It's only right with World Ocean Day on Wednesday the 8th of June that today's theme is all about water because as my guest Glenn Edney explains we are water beings and the ocean is a living process the hub of the water cycle that sustains all life forms. It's also crucial we reframe our relationship with the ocean away from thinking of her as an external resource to one that acts in alignment with an understanding that she's an integral part of our internal environment and the source of our very own life force. Last week we discovered how the soundscape of birdsong and the restoration of everything on land is affected by pests like rats, mice and stoats. This week we come to terms with the fact that us humans are the pests, destroying the structure and soundscape of the sea. For most people, sight is the primary sense organ used to make sense of our place and relationship to the world. Marine life, however, rely on sound as their primary sense to navigate, find food, woo mates, coordinate spawning, avoid predators, keep track of their offspring, intimidate rivals and find a new home. We know this, yet we continue to inflict chronic noise pollution in the ocean from vessels, mining and construction. Data collected using hydrophones in the Rangitoto channel during lockdown showed a threefold drop in anthropogenic noise, uncovering an underwater soundscape akin to an orchestral symphony. Distinct sounds like a bridey whale's calling, dolphins whistling and clicking, a seal barking, fish popping and grunting and waves crashing on island shorelines three kilometres away were all recorded. The ocean is not out there. She's an integral part of us. And the reality is, what we do to the ocean, we do to ourselves. We're choking from microplastics and deafened by a barrage of noise. We've lost sight of what's really important, which is reverence for diversity and the extraordinary interconnected web of life. Creating marine protected areas is one way to reduce the level of human activity. Global leaders have threatened to protect 30% of the oceans by 2030, but they're really dragging their feet, evident by lack of commitment from organisations like CAMLAR, which is the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, who have denied protection to areas in Antarctica for the past five years. It's not like we need any more scientific evidence to prove protection preserves marine life. You can show your support for Antarctica by signing the petition in the show notes. Another way to create change is to participate in a group in your local area. And if there isn't one, start one up. Surfers in the UK have formed a group called Surfers Against Sewage, who are doing their bit to help the ocean recover. And they've created a free app called Safer Seas Service that covers 390 beaches across England, Scotland and Wales with information about water pollution, surf conditions, tide times, lifeguard services and beach activities. There's also a great campaign by Sea Shepherd called GhostNet, all about removing harmful discarded fishing equipment from UK coastal waters. You can find all their details on their Facebook page, link in the show notes. Here in New Zealand, Sustainable Coastlines have compiled a list of recommended ocean podcasts that provide information and inspiration about the fantastic world that lies beneath the surface of the sea. On land, scientists in Chile are waiting for confirmation that the Patagonian cypress tree they found with a four metre thick trunk could be the world's oldest living tree at 5,484 years old, beating the current record holder of 4,853-year-old bristlecone pine in California. There's deep concern here in New Zealand about the company Global Contracting Solutions Limited, whose proposal to build an incinerator in the Waikato region because it would pump out toxic pollution into the air seven days a week for 365 days a year. 
that a proposal needs a land use resource consent from Waipa District Council to use the 11 hectare site for the incinerator. It also needs three resource consents from the Waikato Regional Council. The first to discover toxic substances in the air, the second to fill in the floodplain to build the incinerator and the third to discharge their toxic wastewater. Absolute bonkers. Even if you don't live in the region, it's important to show your support to stop this because the polluted air moves. It's part of the water cycle, which in turn affects the ocean and the land. The show notes give you details of the councils that you can send your comments to. I came across a superb in-depth article on the abhorrent way we're intoxicating the land and the far-reaching repercussions it has on wildlife and our waterways. It's a fascinating read, highlighting the nonsensical lawful practices that allow us to continue to use them, despite the fact that they're totally annihilating nature's processes. It's too long to share here, so I put a link in the show notes. Reverence for the process of water is crucial to restore balance on Mother Earth. And my guest today, Glenn Edney, shares how his love, deep connection and knowledge of the ocean as a marine ecologist was expanded after a life-changing encounter with a humpback whale, which helped him embody the wisdom of the ocean. And he now uses it to enthuse and educate people to appreciate the ocean as the heart of all of life's processes. Welcome to the show, Glenn. Thank you so much for joining me. Now, with um, World Environment Day on the 5th and World Ocean Day on the 8th, I couldn't think of a better person to talk to my listeners and help them understand that the ocean is alive and she's a living being. Oh, kia ora, Philippa. Thank you so much for uh, having me along. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's great that we have specific days where we have a focus of course every day gives you that opportunity my focus is probably always the moana maybe as we talk it might become clear to your listeners that there's no such thing as a separate ocean the ocean is part of this even larger living being papa tunuku and when we as individuals and and in our our groups and and our, our daily activities it's incredibly important that we separate things. Um, you know, this is our how we get through our daily lives. We do need to have compartments of this and that. But one of the things that we've done is we've forgotten that that's just a process of our daily activity and it doesn't represent the actual reality of interbeing. I'm borrowing from Thich Nhat Hanh there. But, uh, well, that's and, and fascinating that's... because uh, there's a lot of talk about the separation and the reconnection of everything. But it's um, really interesting that you talk about perhaps it's the part of being human that we need to separate in order to understand. But we've lost the art of putting the pieces together and reconnecting and actually being able to see the big picture. Yes, exactly. And and as we go through our daily lives, we, <clears throat> we have a lot of choices to make. We have to make decisions on our daily activities. We live in a world where it's important that we're able to make some judgments on these daily activities. And you know, to make the, the most basic example of that, the flight or fright, fight or fright, flight <laughs> <laughs> process, you know, so those are a set of decisions that we need to make. And we've often thought about that as, as just being a completely instinctual process. But in actual fact, there's a lot more going on than just pure instinct. There's choice making going on. It, and it's just at a, a level of consciousness that we're not always aware of. And it's important that we can operate at a level throughout our daily activities where we don't have to be completely conscious of all of the choices that we're making. But that doesn't mean that there isn't choice making going on and judgments about things going on. So that helps us through our day. That's our, if you like, that's the role of the left brain. That's what we need it for. It's the servant to daily activity. Um, getting us through the day. But when we forget that that's the servant and the right brain activity of connectedness um, is what the left brain is in service to. And so when that happens, we forget actually that interconnectedness is the actual reality. That's when we get into trouble. Uh, and, And, you know, I see that in the ocean and the way that we relate to the ocean all the time. Um, it's still a resource bank. It's still a, an ecosystem service on a grand scale. You know, all of those sorts of perceptions 
are the, are the perceptions of separation. I always find it's like my sanctuary because I have a great love of it and People go there instinctively for relaxation and things like that. And some people swim in it on a daily basis. You were talking about the separateness and how we have compartmentalized the ocean into different oceans when in fact it is one ocean that serves. So as you know that I'm a great advocate for the Antarctica and it's not exactly on our doorstep. And so people think, well, that doesn't affect me. Well, it's part of the ocean and the water flows and whatever happens here is going to happen down there. Actually, without the, a healthy ocean, we're not going to survive, are we? And so, you know, going back to what I how I opened, it's like she's very much alive and then an important element of our everyday lives, isn't she? Absolutely. And I think you've touched on a couple of really important things. So there is one ocean and for our convenience, and it's helpful, um, we've used the the boundaries that are created by the uh, continents to create these ideas of these separate oceans, Atlantic, North, South, Pacific, North, South, Antarctic, Arctic, and so on. Indian Ocean. Uh, and there's not there's absolutely nothing wrong with that as long as we do remember that this is one process. And I've come now to think of ocean as process as much as organism or being, because where are the boundaries actually? Now I'm I'm sitting up here in Taitokoro, I'm not too far from the ocean, but in actual fact, the ocean's in the room with me because every breath I'm taking, it's not only the oxygen that's in that air that's uh, being provided at least half of it from a living ocean, but I'm breathing in and breathing out ocean water every single breath. There is no such thing as ocean water, fresh water, and so on as these separate entities. This is water in process. And it's one of the the core things that if we try and go back to a source of how a living planet comes into being, we really go back into what are the elements that create that. And the combination of elements that make life possible really come down to have its origins really in water. And so here we are, we're an ocean planet, which means a water planet, Mm. Um, a water being. So water is the living being manifesting in different ways. Our conception and our experience of ocean is one manifestation of this process. Life as process is water facilitated. And without this great body of water that we call ocean, for me, when water is in the ocean state, it's back to its center, if you like. And so... Yeah. Um, And so all of these other flows uh, that water goes through, you know, whether it be our biological water, um, the different phases of water, you know, all four of them. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, and so all of these are part of that flow. But when water comes back into an ocean way of being, it's kind of like coming home. As I say, it's just my conception. It's just because I'm an ocean person, really. You bring your experience both uh, as a, a an ocean ecologist um, and as a a professional diver and someone who sails. So there are many different perspectives that you have used to create a connection with the ocean, haven't you? I mean, one of my earlier guests in one of the earlier episodes was Vida Austin, and she talked about the secret intelligence of water. Absolutely fascinating. And it is everywhere around us, and it's the reason that we're alive, isn't it? Absolutely. And in fact, we are water. And as I think is now becoming more and more widely known, the idea of um, that we're about 70% water is is really a a total misconception. And that's only really by weight that we can apply that. And in actual fact, of course, um, we're 99% water because 99% of the molecules in every single cell are water molecules. But here's another thing the people that you're talking to immediately frame that in a human perspective oh we're 99% water so I just want to make sure that people are clear that's all of life so when I say we I mean everybody the ocean is filled with people the forests are filled with people and all of those people the trees the birds all of the ocean beings we're all animated water and so the flow of water is the flow of life So without a healthy ocean being, 
we have a major problem with the flow of life and the fundamental conception of the ocean as a resource bank or the ocean as this geophysical force on the planet, which is the major factor in climate, in the transference of oxygen around the planet and the transference of heat around the planet. Of course, the ocean does all of those things. But when we conceptualize in those kind of ecosystem services, geophysical processes, there's not a lot of life in that kind of thinking. I kind of like to think of it instead, if we're looking at the ocean as living being, if we're looking at Papa Tunuku as this living being or Gaia, if you like, these are life processes. This is physiology that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the physical process, which is the circulation, metabolism, respiration, uh, which all living beings are involved in, yep. including the, the whole planet. So those are those physical processes. So that's really different from ecosystem services right from the start. We can learn a lot by the processes of the ocean to help ourselves, can't we? Absolutely. And from an ecological perspective, if we get into a bit of a dispassionate frame of mind as ecologists, then we're looking at nutrient cycling as one of the fundamental aspects of a life process. The whole planet is the ultimate recycling machine from that perspective. I shy away mostly from framing things in that way. But if we're looking at those ecologically speaking relationships, then the foundation of what we are really focusing on is how those relationships interact in the terms of the cycling and recycling of nutrients. So that's great. Nothing wrong with that. But it's a limited view when we're focusing just on the physical. Now, if we have a GP and they just solely focus on the physical aspects of our symptoms, we're likely to go home fairly dissatisfied. We're certainly likely to go home without having any kind of remedies to what was ailing us in the first place. And we're probably pretty likely to look for another GP because we want somebody who's going to meet us in our wholeness and our the energetic, physical, spiritual, emotional beings that we are. So why would we think any differently when we are trying to study the ocean or the forest or, or anything else for that matter? We need to meet these places in their wholeness. And so having an experience of place as alive, sentient, and reciprocal in terms of they're having an experience of you as much as you're having an experience of them helps you to move in towards that more holistic kind of GP process where we're looking at the whole person. And so for me, the ocean as living being is not just all of those physical attributes that I was talking about, um, but then you have the consciousness, then you have the emotional state and the deep spiritual aspect of any living being. I remember so, in your book that you spoke <clears throat> of your experience with the humpback whale, which my understanding of it was that it really helped you to embody all of what you just said. Yeah, sure. I was actually talking to somebody the other day in an interview, and I said, right, for those of you who are not keen on the idea that there's other forms of communication besides our physiological forms through sound and, and touch and, and so on, you better go and make yourself a cup of tea now, because I'm just going to be starting to talk about a consciousness type of communication, which some people would call telepathy. Um, I find that a bit limiting. So sometimes I say direct mind to mind communication. Before you dive More... into the story, could you expand on how you interpret the word consciousness? Mm, okay. Consciousness is the fundamental state of the universe from my perspective. It's not possible to be conscious in an unconscious universe. It's not possible to be sentient in an unsentient or insentient universe. Mm. Um, and that was um, Morris Merleau-Ponty, the great French phenomenologist who actually said that about sentience. Um, how can you possibly be sentient in an insentient world? So um, simple sentient, but and profound. But, yeah, so yeah. Obvious, so obvious, really. It, it is kind of obvious, um, and that's often the hardest things to grasp are the most obvious ones. Consciousness is, again, process for me, and it's a process that we participate in. 
just, you know, the whole life process is something that we all participate in, whether we're doing it actively, passively, sometimes it's one or the other, and sometimes it's both at the same time. All of it is grounded in a process or a participation in this consciousness process. So the idea of measuring levels of consciousness is a purely human-centric idea. The idea of compartmentalizing the evolutionary process and saying that there's a hierarchy, that there's a general direction, a general flow from less evolved to more evolved is kind of old thinking now. And there aren't as many evolutionary biologists thinking that way anymore. Uh, I, I can't say all, obviously. Uh, but That in itself but, is a process. <laughs> that's a process, indeed, yeah. <laughs> One of the concepts that I came to understand and the, and the humpback whale helped me a lot was that, that this consciousness process is a fundamental aspect of evolution. And so we have an evolving universe. How can we have an evolving planet? How can we have evolving biological life in a non-evolving universe? It, yeah, it's just nonsensical. Yep. If there is any evolution anywhere in the universe, then the universe is an evolving place an evolving space and an evolved evolution process. So consciousness has become clearly uh, evident in the universe and has been for a very, very long time. And so consciousness is part of that evolutionary process. So the beginning of consciousness in the ocean, so in other words, in terms of this planet from a biological sense, starts in the ocean and starts right at the very, very beginning of biological life. 3.94 billion years ago, maybe even as far back as 4.2 billion years ago. We really don't know. But right from the very start, life is communal. Life started out communally with bacterial colonies. And there's a need to have perception within that. So there's a need to understand what's going on within your own cell. And there's a need to understand what's going on amongst this, your fellow bacterium. And there's a need to understand what's going on in the world around you. So interoception, exteroception are fundamental beginnings of life. In this case, you're collecting basically chemical information as this world first bacterium amongst all of the billions of others. But what are you going to do with it? There's no point in collecting that information unless you've got a way of processing it and making decisions about it. So perception is fundamental to life. Understanding that there are choices to make and the ability to make them is fundamental at the very, very beginning of life. Communicating those choices and communicating what you're experiencing to others was fundamental. So what else about what we understand about consciousness is not covered by those things? Self-reflection. We really focus on the ability to be self-reflective as a, a pointer towards our highly evolved level of consciousness. Now, what type of self-reflection is needed by a bacterium when it's inside its own body sensing whether it's hungry whether it's got toxins in its body or any of those sorts of things it's an appropriate level of awareness and an appropriate level of the ability to be reflective of oneself for that situation so in other words perfectly evolved and no need for anything further as life becomes more complex, different forms of that ability to be self-reflective come into play. So our consciousness starts in, the, in terms of our physical ability to reflect upon ourselves, starts at the beginning of biological life in the ocean, four billion years ago, and continues to this day in a perfect form for the current place within that process that we find ourselves. So for me, it's not a hierarchical process of going from less conscious to more conscious. It's a process of flow in terms of what do we require from our consciousness in this particular moment. That was not a very short explanation of how I see consciousness. but uh. <laughs> It's awesome. No, it was interesting to me because we hear a lot about consciousness and things. And actually, just going back to what you were saying at the beginning, we make a judgment on the levels of consciousness from our own human 
perspective. And so it's fascinating to hear you talk about bacteria and all forms of life having a level of consciousness and a perception and being able to self-reflect. And just because it's not in the same way that we do it, it doesn't make it any more or less necessary. And I think that is a massive message for everybody to understand just to step back and get out of the way and appreciate that the diversity of everything is imperative to us to continue to evolve. Uh, I, yeah, beautifully put, Philippa. I couldn't agree with you more. And as you were saying that, that really cemented for me where my experience with the mother humpback whale comes into that because what she was actually showing me and helping me experience was the wider consciousness beyond myself and that complete interbeing as a flow of consciousness. When we are focused on that hierarchical kind of measurement, it's hard for us to get out of our own head and realize that we're part of this flow. It's not only a flow of our individual conscious awareness and reflection but we're part of a flow of a universal consciousness which is into being in essence my beautiful experience with the humpback whale which was in the kingdom of tonga in the hapai islands in 2010 was a journey into that into being but it was a guided journey and a facilitated journey because it was probably something that i wasn't actually capable of well i definitely wasn't capable of actually uh, at that time but it came about because I had been spending the last six years living in the Hapai Islands, running a whale watching and diving business. Purpose for having a business was so that I could spend lots of time with the whales, basically. Um, <laughs> love I had a love, love affair with humpback whales for a really long time. Like any naturalist, I just wanted to get to know these other beings. And I, I just love the idea of being a naturalist is starting to become okay again. And I was talking to somebody the other day, I was doing an interview and I was explaining that a good naturalist is a person who has the ability to be completely present and to be completely present with attention to what is going on around them but also within themselves. So you need to be present to yourself. You need to be present to everything that's around you. And then you need to be rigorous. So your observations need to be rigorous. You need to be clear about what you're actually experiencing, observing, and you need to be clear about how those experiences and those observations are being processed within yourself. And this is the art of phenomenological work. Um, being able to be clear about what's you in terms of what you're experiencing and what you're experiencing of the other. Going back to the humpback whale, well, when I was reading it, mm. I got a sense of your own awareness, the connection between yourself and the humpback whale, well, but there was this space in between where you lost touch with yourself, but you were a small part in a huge thing and it brought it all together. Yeah, that's right. And so it was like a, a three-act play, I should say. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so the first instance is that, uh, you know, I'm drawn into the water by this huge presence. And, you know, this is a physical act on her part um, to stop our boat, um, to make us stop. And then I'm feeling completely drawn into the water, like beyond my control, in fact. Right. Because we have a process when we're getting in the water with these beautiful beings and and that process is rules around it that we developed for ourselves about how much time we would spend waiting and just observing and all of that was just thrown out the window because I was being pulled into the water by her presence um, and as soon as I was in the water that presence really started to envelop me to the point that where I actually got to within a couple of meters of her head you know, she's laying on the surface, a little male calf is right beside her. When I got there, um, I did the most insane things that you would never do in these situations. You know, you're in an ocean environment with a massive, inverted commas here, folks, wild being. Um, and so I closed my eyes. You know, the one sense that I should be relying on in that situation to keep myself safe and everything, I shut off. 
And as soon as I closed my eyes, I went vertical in the water. I opened my arms and kind of supplication. And that's when I felt this huge presence, not only enveloping me, but actually physically entering into my body, which was a very overwhelming and frightening experience. And I did feel quite frightened by it. And there was an urge within me to actually get away and leave. And what was amazing was that while I was feeling that, I started feeling this calming sensation. And I realized that that the, the mother humpback was actually completely aware of my fear and was actually calming me, sending me calming energy. Um, but it was already inside me. And that was incredible to feel a sense of calm emanating from her, but within me. And it worked. I did feel a lot calmer. And then I became very aware that the calf was also part of this. Um, I could feel his energy. I could feel his consciousness. I was kind of able to be part of his consciousness and realize that he wasn't feeling calmed. He was still quite frightened and unsure about the situation. And I could feel her calming him as well. I could experience that. It wasn't working so much and, and I could actually feel him physically moving closer to her, but I still had my eyes closed. I had my eyes closed the whole time wow. um, through this whole experience. And then basically as the passenger, <laughs> um, she took me on a journey into her consciousness. I had this, first of all, the sensation that she's inside me. I can feel her and everything. But then it's like she took me inside her consciousness. And I did have a sensation, a bit of a feeling of being inside her body. But it's very vague. There was nothing really clear or anything. I had sensations of journeying, vague sensations of other whales, their energy and so on. But you know, no pictures in the mind or anything like that. No words or anything like that. It was just the sensations, these feelings. But then going into her consciousness, that was much clearer in that she had things to show me. And to say the word show would indicate that I'm seeing something, but it's not really that way. But you know, our language is, is too yeah. limited to really encompass this. So what she was showing me was that everything was one, everything was interconnected. And what connects everything was the water, the ocean herself, the living water is what connects everything. And so expanding outwards, and that was, I actually had this physical uh, experience of expanding outwards. And I, I know, I'm sure you've done it yourself, but, you know, when you're in the ocean and you lay on your back and you, you know, kind of spread your legs, spread your arms, and mm. you're just laying there and you're being held by the water. If you can imagine, if you're in that state and it's calm, it's warm, the sun's coming down on top of you, you're spread out, you've got your eyes closed and you just kind of feel yourself spreading out through your fingertips, through your toes, your whole body just kind of spreading. And, and it was that experience, except like manifest to a, a, a such a degree that there was no boundaries whatsoever. It was just a total expansion out. The best way to describe that was that it's, that's a consciousness expansion. And that's really what she was really showing me was that this idea of interbeing, it's real, but it's at a consciousness level and a physical level, and that we are actually all connected at that conscious level. So, you know, Jung's um, collective subconscious, but taken to a spaciousness that probably Jung never even could conceptualize of. Although in some of his nature writings, you can really get that sense that he actually probably did see that potential at least. As soon as I was really fully en enmeshed in that, I actually felt her withdrawing and it was an awful feeling. It's like, no, no, don't, don't leave. But I could feel her withdrawing. And of course, I understood, okay, it's job done. She's shown me what she needed to show me. The rest of the episode came to a close. It was about around about 40 minutes long in total, including a bit of time back on the boat where she and her car finally, after I was back on the boat, came back over to the boat and we had our sort of final farewells. And then they both dived underneath the boat 
came up about 100 meters to the south of us and and disappeared and oh. yeah so it obviously a life changing experience um and it, and it's the experience that actually gave me what i at the time i saw it as a job to do which was that you know my job was now to stop having all this fun in the ocean and go and do some work <laughs> um, <laughs> and the work was and is and and continues to be in any way possible helping people my fellow humans to understand that we are part of this beautiful water facilitated consciousness that is life manifest and this is a process of interbeing this is a process of complete interconnectedness um, interdependence and a process of pure joy and love which when it's that pure joy and love that includes the violence of predation it includes death and separation all of these things are part of that process and accepting all of that as part of this consciousness journey this living planetary journey is that's what life is that's the job that she set me um and that's what at the time culminated in the book the ocean is alive and continues to be the journey <laughs> So how are you going to help Joe Public live better lives themselves? Okay, so in terms of the ocean, we are clearly in a changing phase in our relationship with the ocean because now the ocean has come into people's awareness as being in trouble. Yeah. Uh, and it's come into that awareness as being in trouble from an anthropocentric and human-centered perspective, which is... The ocean's in trouble, therefore, isn't going to be able to supply us with all of the things that she has been supplying us with. I see my work as acknowledging that that is true, that that is the case, that you know the amount of kaimoana that is available to us is much decreased from what it was, that these ecosystem services, more inverted commas, folks, commas, um, these ecosystem services are starting to disintegrate and collapse. But those aren't the real problems. The real problem is our relationship with, in this case, the ocean, but our relationship with the life process, which is the ocean. The invitation, I think, that we have at this point in time is to stop for a moment and reflect on what our individual relationship is with place. Uh, obviously, I have an ocean focus. And so when I reflect, it's always about the ocean. But remembering that the ocean is everywhere, it's in the atmosphere, you know, 15,000 cubic kilometers of water in the atmosphere at any given moment. Wow. Every single cubic kilometer of water is the equal of 400,000 Olympic sized swimming pools. So 400,000 times 15,000, I don't know the maths, but there's a lot of water <laughs> Six in the atmosphere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot, right? So no matter where you are on the planet, you're in the ocean because it's water. Our invitation at the moment, and it's a necessity, I would say it's an invitation, but in a way, this is what we're required to do for our very survival and our survival means the survival and the thriving of the entire planetary life process. Because without the thriving of that entire process, then there is no thriving or survival for us as an individual species. So that interconnectedness needs to start with individual people attending to their relationship with place. In my work now, I work with communities who are interested in looking after their own patch of the ocean. And so the starting point for that is for each individual to really explore their personal relationship, physical, spiritual, emotional, energetic, with their patch of water, their patch of the coastline, their patch of the harbour, the estuary, whatever it may be, or maybe it's an hour further upstream, wherever it is. Um, what about those that can't quite grasp the concept of what you're saying who live in the cities who are not near a body of physical water that they can mm. see? So I say go to the park, sit under a tree, mm -hmm. because as you sit under the tree, you are participating in an ocean water process. 
I live in a valley. I can't see the ocean from my house. Every morning, especially at this time of the year when there's so much dew overnight. And at this time, as soon as the sun, before I can even see the sun, the very first trees are starting to evapotranspirate. So they're starting to release water from the underside of their leaves. And that water is water that they've drawn up from the soil, as well as water that's been absorbed through the leaves. All of that water has been through the full spectrum of reservoirs or pools of water, which is ocean, it's fresh water, subterranean water, glaciers, biological water. It's been through all of those pools countless times. So no matter where you are, if you just find yourself a place to sit or lay, a place where you can touch something, uh, whether it be some grass, some tree bar. If you're sitting on your balcony uh, on the 15th floor and you've got a plant with you, just feel the leaf. You're connecting to the ocean. You're connecting to the water. You're connecting to the source. <laughs> it's hard for me because I live close to the ocean. I'm at the ocean every single day. Now, I'm in the ocean almost every day. So it, it is hard for me to conceptualize being a human and not having that. I once spent six months living inland in the US and we were supposed to be there for two years. And after six months, I said to my partner, I'm really sorry, but I just cannot stay here. And we lived right next to the Connecticut River as well. At that stage, I'd never lived away from the ocean. I'd never been away from it. And I was falling apart. Anyway, we moved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that relationship with place. And so whatever that place is that you're at, my daughter's going to Mongolia, to the Mongolian steppes to ride horses for a thousand kilometers. And you would think, well, you couldn't be any further away from the ocean and the Mongolian steppes, but there are rivers, there's ice, there's still the atmosphere all around you. So she's actually no further away from ocean than if she's right here um, on the coast. I think if we, if we think about our way that we perceive the world, our sensual experience of the world, so much dominated by our sight, we're used to saying, oh, I'm connecting to the ocean when I can see it. I often say to people, you can draw on the imagination, which is one of the most powerful gifts that we've been given as humans. And we don't know whether we're physically there or not. The mind doesn't know. So you can mm. draw on the imagination to create that um, picture for yourself. So what mm. else are you actually currently doing? I know you've got a lot to do with schools and things, but there's also a sea bin, which is fascinating. Can you tell the listeners about that? Um, yep. So uh, in Tutakaka Marina, we have uh, what's called a sea bin, which is basically a rubbish bin that sits in the water. It's got a submersible pump at the bottom of it. It draws water into the bin. It has a, a structure and then a, an internal bin, you know, just like our rubbish bins in the park um, that have the outside bit and you've got the bag in the middle. Yep. Well, we've basically got an outside container and we have a bag in the middle, except that it's a, a mesh bag. And water is drawn into the top of this rubbish bin and it goes up and down. So it creates a, a bit of a, a current of its own and draws things that are floating on the surface towards it when they get sucked in and then they are in the mesh bag. It's a tool for collecting floating plastic. I mean, it collects other things too, like, you know, floating seaweed, leaves and you know, other organic stuff that's floating around. And now there are over a thousand of them around the world. We now have, I think, four or five. I think it's five in Aotearoa now. So that's in about three and a half years. And in that three and a half years, um, that small sea bin, and just to give people an idea, it's around about the same size as, let's see, about a 30 litre bucket. It's not big, but that small bucket has collected around about 4,000 pieces of plastic. For people who don't know, Tutukaka is a small coastal harbour, almost halfway between Whangarei and Cape Breton in the Bay of Islands, not quite halfway. Uh, and it's a small harbour and we have a smallish marina. So you would expect that place would be pretty clean and there wouldn't be too much plastic laying around. But the plastic has become so ubiquitous in the ocean now that it doesn't matter where you are. You can be in your beloved Antarctica and you're still going to find microplastics in every drop of water the that you pick up. Fish that the penguins are eating. Yep. It breaks your mm. heart. 
Mm. It does. So the seed bin is a very small tool to address a very, very large problem. And so we see it as something that's worthwhile doing in terms of every piece of plastic that's removed from the ocean is worthwhile. Um, but we see it more as an education tool. Mm. Uh, and really how that works is not so much educating people about ocean plastic. It's helping people to understand that there are no boundaries. Yes, it's what we were talking about at the beginning, absolutely. Yeah, Mm. Yeah. so, you know, the the plastic packaging that comes with your product or your food or whatever it is, and that you dispose of as carefully as you can, whether it be in recycling or whatever, and you then lose control over it. There are no boundaries between that piece of plastic finding its way into being recycled into something else or into landfill and it finding its way into the ocean. It's a matter of luck, care and process. At the moment, we are still losing about half of all plastic that supposedly is going to go to landfill. It doesn't end up getting there. Now, a fair chunk of that ends up just in the environment. Although we try to estimate how much plastic is actually in the ocean, it is the proverbial iceberg. What we see on the surface is just the tip of what's in the ocean. And so any kinds of mitigation processes that we can use as individuals count. And I guess that, that kind of brings me into other aspects of the work, which is that what we do as individuals in our own place is actually the most important thing. Um, So international treaties, beautiful, large marine protected areas like um, the beautiful one in the Ross Sea. And, and, you know, we now got talk again now of the Kermadec Marine Reserve being extended and that's looking promising again. And we've now had these beautiful, big, large areas being given some form of protection from human activities. Mm -hmm. I'll make that point as well. We're protecting a place from human activities. That's as far as our level of control goes. That's it. So we're not managing place. We're managing behavior. Those are really great. Those big international things are great. However, they don't necessarily address behavioral change because you can have as many marine reserves as you like, but if you've got the same behavior going on outside of those marine reserves, because there are no boundaries, there are no fences in the ocean, we're unfortunately, we're not actually achieving what we're hoping to achieve by having those MPAs, those marine protected Mm. areas. Mm -hmm. So behavioral change is at the core. And behavioral change, first and foremost, can start by attending to relationship with place. And when we attend to our personal relationship with place and we become engaged with the well-being of that place, with the modi of that place, we're on the road to change. And that change is behavioral change. Um, It's not we're now going to repair this place, we're going to regenerate this place. Those are really happy byproducts of a behavioral change, which has already happened, which is that you're attending to your relationship with place. That changed relationship is what's going to engender that the physical activities that you undertake um, for that regenerative process. It might sound so obvious that it's like, of course, that's what's happening. Um, But if we don't attend to that, if we don't actually name that as being the most important part, what does happen, and and I've got a lifetime of experience of this, so I can say for sure that this is what happens, is that we continue along the path of separation. We continue along the path of ecosystem services, of resources for our use. We just have to learn how to use them better. And that does not engender behavioral change. No, no. It engenders trickery of the mind. Mm -hmm. For example, this week is budget time. We're already having our pre-announcements of all the billions of dollars that are going to be spent on carbon neutrality. Yeah. All of those things. Where is the behavioral change in any of that? Yeah. So, So when it comes to the ocean, you know, for me... Again, that's the fundamental aspect of any work. As a human ecologist myself, the big thing is about the reflection and taking responsibility for ourselves and for our actions is a biggie. And actually spelling it out and recognising the repercussions of it. So, yes, we can clear up the mess. 
but are we going to stop making more mess because otherwise it's a vicious circle, isn't it? Absolutely, Philippa. Yeah, I agree with you entirely. You know, the other thing about the ocean <laughs> is that she is incredibly resilient. So the work that we do, uh, we have our trust in Te Waru or Te Moana Nui Ocean Spirit Trust and Wetland Regeneration Project. We have the sea bin. Um, we have a kelp regeneration project happening in Tutakaka. And also I'm doing a PhD at the moment in Māori Studies Department at Auckland University. University, and that's also looking at how we engage with place with a focus on connecting to the modi of place through that life force that is essential life essence. And with all of the projects that we're doing, the first part of that project is to get a sense of the modi of that place. And so we use a qualitative monitoring process that I've developed over the last sort of decade or so, um, which is designed to give us feedback, to, you know, to give us information, to give us data, but not in a quantitative way. It is empirical, but not in a quantitative way. What we're actually really looking for is feedback on the well-being, the state of the place from the perspective of the place not from our perspective. Mm. So that's out there for some. <laughs> but love it is. Yeah, it, it is out there for some. But when you actually give it a go, you find that it's not so woo woo as you think it is. And in actual yeah. fact, it's how we've been operating forever uh, up until the last few hundred years. And I would say that uh, the intelligence of our environment is beyond our comprehension. One of my guests the other week was David Martin, and he was talking about covalence and how forms come together and create something. But he's doing the reverse of the carbon zero thing in as much as he says that objects have their own memory of their original essence. And so rather than the process being degrading, we are repurposing something until it is no longer of any use. It's like taking it right back to its original form. And we need to tap into that. And I think it's it's fantastic to hear how this whole thing is opening up. And we might like to think that we are incredibly intelligent ourselves. But as you say, Mother Earth is incredibly resilient and has everything and all the intelligence to keep rebalancing all the shit that we keep throwing at her, basically, doesn't she? And so, yep. yeah, that's that's just amazing. I think it's a fantastic inspirational for us to draw an end to the conversation. So like all my guests, I like to ask four specific questions. And the first is, is there a book and or a person that has influenced you? And if so, how? I just can't narrow it down to one. Um, <laughs> so nobody so can. It, no, uh, but they're all ocean people and they start off with Jacques Cousteau because he was there in my life at a very, very early age. Uh, first time I saw television, Jacques Cousteau film about sharks. And uh, Dr. Sylvia Earle, yes. um, who I find is just a, such an incredible person and inspiration. She is her, her deepness, that's for yeah, sure. Yeah, I was going to say that's um, how they refer yep. to her, isn't it? Yep, yep. yep absolutely. And uh, my uh, deep friend and um, and mentor, uh, Wade Doak, and his beautiful wife, Jan. So these are people that have really helped me on my way. The other person I'd really like to acknowledge in that, of course, is um, James Lovelock for being such a determined explorer of ideas and an inventor and came up with Gaia theory. Gaia theory is the reason we have earth system science, but Gaia theory is so much more. Gaia theory said, hey, moderns, it's okay for us to be spiritual beings as well. Yeah, all of the ocean beings are probably my greatest teachers. And of course, the humpback whale. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a very special yeah. place in your heart. Exactly. It sure does. <laughs> Do you have a quote that you find inspiring or something that keeps you going? Uh, yeah, I have many, um, but I think the one that comes to me a lot you know, is Mother Teresa's saying about um, we ourselves may think that what we do is but a drop in the ocean, but the ocean would be much less without that drop. Mm. And sometimes when I'm giving talks, I say, hey, and look, she's been made a saint, so she must be right. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and again, as I said, the, the core message is it's to Take it upon ourselves and know in our heart we don't have to solve the whole world's problems ourselves. If we each do something, 
take the time out to connect to our environment and make a promise, a pact to do something that will have a positive impact. It's going to have a massive ripple effect. Mm, yeah. So what do you do when you find yourself in a funk? I go free diving. Wow. Yeah, breath hold diving, if I really need to get myself out of it, there's nothing like taking a deep breath, immersing yourself in the ocean, and then just floating below the surface. You can reach neutral buoyancy. So you're neither going up nor down. You're weightless. Doing a breath hold, you become much more of that marine mammal that we all are, and all the boundaries disappear. So that's how I do it. Wow. That must be that space in between, hey? Absolutely. That neutral, that balancing. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So if I was your fairy godmother and could help you solve one thing in the world, what would that be and why? I would say apart from helping everybody to attend to their relationship with place, there is something else that's very, very important in this particular time. Um, I would find a way for people to understand that when we talk about climate change, we are talking about something other than the climate process. We're talking about our relationship with our mother's breath. Our mother's breath relies on all of us. And remember that all of us are water beings and water is at the core of this thing that we call climate. And carbon dioxide is a very, very important balancer within a much larger system, which is facilitated by water. The water cycle is the most important aspect of climate dynamics. I'm not saying that we shouldn't pay attention to our carbon emissions. It's very important. However, the most important thing is a healthy water cycle. The planetary water cycle is the result of every individual place-based water cycle on the planet. The global water cycle is the emergent property of millions of individual localized water cycles. Please attend to your relationship with place with the intention of healing a local water cycle. If you do that, you are doing more for climate mitigation than anything else that you could possibly imagine. Wow, I've got tingles. And I'm almost brought to tears. That's amazing. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Philippa. Take care. Next week, I'm talking to Kay Muller of Yogi Fish, who overcame her fear of the ocean and now reaps the benefits of a year-round daily dip in her healing qualities. She's formed a community of like-minded enthusiasts under the umbrella of a business called Yogi Fish, which integrates yoga and swimming to balance the mind, body and soul. Follow or subscribe to the podcast on your preferred platform, be it Podbean, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Samsung Podcasts or my YouTube channel so you don't miss out on future episodes. And don't forget to get in touch if you have a subject or guest you'd like me to consider. My email is info at philiparos.com. So until next week, dig deep, open your mind to a world of possibilities, live life with a generous heart and take steps to minimise waste and maximise your own potential.